Oh. Oh, another day in Taipei. Tell you what, that's better than top and tailing with Levy. I'm not doing that again. Oh, All right. Let's get some coffee, get down to business for our last day in Taipei. Hello and welcome to the final day of our coverage from Taiwan. The country has been amazing. The food fantastic. Hanging out with Brian Park, Michael Levy has dragged. But hey, we've got through it and it's not so long until we get back to Canada. Let's have a one last look around to catch up on anything we've missed over our last couple of days of coverage. There were lots of things going on behind us mainly internal headset rearing, so I'm just going to avoid all that. But we have Lima here, which were a brand perhaps more known for their road cycling helmets. Some big road cycling teams on their roster, but they've got some new mountain biking ones as well. So here we have their new Etna helmet. Now these three quarter shell helmets can often score quite highly on the Gimli scale. This one I think is actually pretty good. It's quite angular. It's got, I think, 17 vents. Visor comes up. You can store your eyewear there and also these cheek pads aren't as stiff as on some other brands. Now, whilst Lima say that they're still very strong and offer lots of protection, it means that you're not going to get any pressure points. Previously, I've tried out this style of helmet, and sometimes, because of these big old chubby cheeks of mine, it actually kind of connects and rubs there. These ones, it actually feels a bit more comfortable with a bit more flex. I'm actually going to pop it on. So, you have a couple of different sizes of these pads to accommodate your face, and actually, around the side, of the helmet there, they do have little channels, so you can put on your big old sunglasses. The helmet whoop, is available, I think five colors. Yeah, I think it looks pretty tidy. And it's available very soon for the European Northern Hemisphere summer. And yeah, the Lima Etna helmet. Uh, we're gonna go see MRP, they've got some chain devices. I have no idea where we're going. I know I said MRP, I actually meant Lazine. We're here now. So we're here at Lazine and they have this novel tire plug. So you go from the inside of the tire out and basically you have this metal tether here which you can latch some pliers onto and you use it almost kind of, it's like a hybrid between a plug and a patch kit. You then use some kind of glue, pull it through nice and tight and then you cut it off the length. You get, I think it's about $16 for a pack of six of three different sizes and they claim it's a permanent fix for tubeless tires because it does absolutely suck when you buy a brand new tire and you destroy it when the tread's really good. And I think honestly, this gives me more confidence in terms of the design than that standard kind of bacon rasher style. And I can imagine this holding a lot better over time because sometimes I felt with the old style or the, the current style, I should say, sometimes they can be kind of agitated as the tire kind of warps and deforms through turns and, and compressions. This looks like a combination of the best of both worlds, of the patch and the plug. MRP? MRP? Yes, 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 yes! MRP, it's been days, days looking for this. It's like water in the desert. I started to think they didn't exist. Please tell me someone's there. Yes, they are open. So behind us, we have the new range that MRP actually released just before we came out here. Now. It's funny, most things with bike mechanics, like internal routing doesn't really bother me, but something about chain devices where you can't access the bolts because of the chain ring, it just is so tedious. So MRP have kind of addressed that. And what you've got here on something like this is this slider can come out, I think it's got seven mil of adjustment with a grub screw access via the front there. And there's also a 45 degree um, bolt. You can basically raise it to change the size for the chain ring. It also means basically that no matter, even when it's really, really low, you don't get any of that kind of not great looking overhang that you can get from some, as you have, you know, these two great big teeth poking out the top. I think they look really tidy. You've also got the ones here, you're sort of downhill and otherwise rated, which will have that slider. I mean, I think there are a lot of teams, riders, not necessarily running a, a bottom guide anymore now that we've gone to narrow wide, especially at World Cups, but a bash guide is super, super important, sorry, bash guard, especially when you're riding places like Fort William, because you can just be smoking cranks. And if you hit something hard enough, not only will it destroy your chain ring, but it can also twist the spider of your cranks. And you know, that's just going through a lot of spares if you're doing one of them a run. So yeah, super important. 
I think they look pretty tidy and like I said, anything that offers that level of adjustment without you having to shout at your crank set, that sounds pretty good to me. So we're here at FSA. On the way here, we kindly got gifted some pineapple cake, very kindly via Spank. But we're gonna talk about headsets. Now, the main thing with headsets here, I would say, is everyone going bananas for internally rooted headsets. Interestingly enough, speaking to some of these brands about, you know, kind of off record why they're doing it, and they say, sort of passing the buck on and saying there's a lot of demand. And I think if you ask customers, they would say there isn't that much demand. So maybe it's sort of, well, I don't know where it's coming from, but it's what we're getting anyway. Now, there are a couple of different headsets here they've got out, all focused on damping of various kinds. You might have seen that kind of Canyon that has that integrated steering damper. Now, the idea of a steering damper isn't new. And actually, like much many things in the bicycle industry, it's cyclical. It just comes back around as we regurgitate and often repackage the same ideas. Now, what you can get with a steering damper is you can get a slightly heavier feeling or more muted feeling on the front. If you imagine driving a car that's got a really light steering feel, it can maybe feel a bit too sensitive. A heavier feeling you know, wheel can mean you can, you can feel as if you can be more precise. And that's what a steering damper aims, aims to do. What its application is on mountain bikes is, you know, the, the jury's still out on that one. But what you're seeing is bikes like cargo e-bikes with a lot of weight and bizarre geometry and maybe small wheels. Steering dampers can be a really good thing. So you get something like this, which can offer different levels of damping, being tar or honey. But also here, you have a self-centering one. Because if you did have something with a really long front center, and imagine, you know, loads and loads of weight, you could end up with something really, really twitchy if, um, if you might have seen those cargo bikes with a really small wheel that's like 15 yards ahead of you. Something like that could be very good. Also, FSA have a reach dust headset out. It's giving three different positions, well, sorry, two different positions a four and an half compared to the normal one, which has a total adjustment of five mil compared to the centered position. There is, of course, lots and lots of <clears throat> internally rooted headset cables, but we're not gonna worry about that. And there is also, if you follow me around here, stems that I've seen floating around for a while, but Levy insists they are brand new. It's the Gradient 35mm clamp downhill stem. And it kind of looks like a, you know how people make kind of like slightly bizarre bottles of perfume? You know what I mean? It looks a bit like that to me, but it is a stem. Um, and yeah, it looks pretty tidy, very different. I don't, know, I don't know if people will go for that, personally. But hey, it's doing something different, good on them. As you might have seen last week, two weeks ago, there was a new Q's release from Shimano, which is very important, many different ways. One of the things they were really aiming for was this kind of notion of cross compatibility and making it easier for the end customer. Even on the nine and 10 speed group sets, they used an 11 speed chain just to keep it uniform throughout. And it means that it gives you lots of upgrade potential in the future. Funnily enough though, even though it uses a standard 11 speed chain, although of course Shimano say that their chains will work best, KMC have already got in there to make a Link Glide optimized system. They say this is basically a slightly different machining to the inner plate to kind of combine with that slightly different tooth profile from that cassette, which apparently gives all those crazy longevity claims around 300% increase. It will still work without a, you know, a specific Link Glide chain, but a company like KMC, which is obviously huge, is only too happy to cater to another giant in Shimano because they will be doing loads of OE specking on next year's bikes, no doubt. And that's it. That's us all wrapped up for the Taipei Cycle Show. We've had a great time in Taiwan as we've oodled and noodled our way through the place. And now it's back to Canada. I think we might have to do some go-karting on the way because it is just the best. Thank you very, 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 very much for following us through the show. And we'll catch you when we're back in North America. Cheers, guys.